It was a powerful, life-changing, monumental, you know, huge mm. energy force telling you what to do. People who are very logical and linear will just sort of say, oh, you know, that was just a fleeting thing. But the experience is so much fuller. And the key, of course, is they are uh, just delivering a message to us. It's up to us to take the action. Allow yourself to recognize it, listen to it, and to follow it. Hello, and welcome to the Jeffrey Eisen podcast. This podcast is about using spiritual wisdom, insights, principles, and practices to integrate and embody into your life in a practical way. My guests share their story of their spiritual journey, as well as how their spiritual beliefs, insights, and practices have helped them live a better life. Their life stories help others understand and accept life's challenging opportunities for learning, expansion, and growth. And once again, welcome to the Shultazar episode of the Jeffrey Eisen podcast. My name is Jeffrey Eisen, and I am so pleased today on the podcast to have as my guest, Hetty Baines from London, England. Welcome, Hetty. Thank you, Jeffrey. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, why don't you uh, tell the guests a bit about yourself? When I first heard about you, I Googled you, and, and, and uh, it's interesting how the word Google has become a verb. Uh, and there was so much written about you. Uh, it was really fascinating to hear uh, about you, and I'm sure you're going to share with our listeners a bit of your personal history. but. Why don't you just tell people a bit about yourself and uh, and how we uh, connected with each other? Thank you, Jeffrey. Well, first of all, just to say that we connected because one night I couldn't sleep and I read my my magazine that is a little bit of the secret that I love, Spirit and Destiny, which we have in the UK, and there was a, a fabulous article about you, Jeffrey which I read, and it resonated with me. And something I did, which I wouldn't normally do after reading an article, was I looked you up, I found your website, I sent you an email, I said, press the button that said, would you like a session with me? I said, yes. And the following day, we were speaking in the afternoon. Um, and we totally did, well, certainly from my perspective, we did resonate. And I um, am thrilled to now have you as I, I feel it as part of my life. Oh, um, thank you so much, Hedy. You know, it's, it's so interesting, uh, listeners, that if you have the courage to follow those nudges, to follow that intuition, and I am so privileged because I get to connect with such amazing people all over the world just because I follow those little nudges and, and, you know, Hetty, you, you may want to ask yourself, what would your life have been like if you would have done those kind of things uh, earlier in your life? Well, I think it, actually those kind of things saved my life probably. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I have had nudges and nudges that, um, just to, to tell it a bit about my life, I, I was raised in um, Dorset in English countryside in a big manor house in a sort of bohemian, very unusual bohemian environment. This was in the mid to late 50s, I have to admit, in the 60s. And uh, you, don't very, have, you don't have to admit it, you <laughs> proudly admit it. I proudly admit, I proudly admit. And, um, but there's nothing, as we said about Google, there's nothing sacred. So one's age is plastered all over it. So you can't even lie about your age anymore. Um, so I was raised in this quite unconventional um, background. And as a ballet dancer, I started a career in ballet when I was really about three. I was on the stage and had a, a career childhood, ending up 
at the Royal Ballet School at 10, to the background of, 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 of a lot of drama going on in, in the family, which I won't go into at this moment, because that would be a whole other podcast, I think. Um, and I lived very, very creatively as a child. I mean, I put, I put on shows, I created plays, I wrote songs, I performed them, I, and I was in charge of it all. I sort of wrote, directed, performed, produced, and this was only at six, you know. Mm, wow. And as well as doing all this ballet, which was, you know, very, very precious. And, but I lived in really in a quite a spiritual way. I had a real sense of my right and my left side. I had knowledge of things as a child, which I remember. I, I kind of had visions. And then when I went through a difficult phase in my teens, when I really wanted to transition from ballet to acting because for all sorts of reasons ballet felt very constricting for me and especially with the drama of the background going on um it seemed that my my creativity and i do i just want to express about creativity digressing for a second in that it, i i explain it by saying it, it's as if it moves around inside you, which of course it's your spirit really, your creative spirit, and going actually I want to come out in this direction now, and now I want to come out in this direction. And actually it's been like that for me a lot of my life. So in my teens, my creativity was going, actually we, we feel too constricted by ballet now. And the Royal Ballet School was, you know, was pretty extreme. <laughs> in the 60s. I'm not sure what it's like now, but, you know, um, amazing as well, because one got to dance with Fontaine and Nereev and choreographed by Nereev and all these amazing things at Covent Garden when I was 12. But the, the, the other side of that was incredibly rigid and incredibly over-disciplined and hot house and so on. And I think I was very expressive as a dancer, probably more suited to a Russian company, maybe. Um, and when I found acting, when we started to have drama, I felt like I'd been let out of the box, you know. It was like, oh, my God, I could express myself in, in a freer way. So I, I, I went from ballet to, to acting, which was very turbulent because my mother was so, so um, you know, c convinced I was really going to be the next Margaret Fontaine. The, 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 your listeners may not even know who these people are, but you know she was the great ballerina of, of the last century. And um, but my inner voice didn't didn't feel the same, and I wanted to follow the path of acting, which I did. But I did go through some turbulence in my teens with mental health issues, anorexia, which sort of almost goes hand in hand with the ballet school, um, and depression and, and various issues. But coming back to your point about nudges, um, I'm, I'm one of the first sort of visions or experiences spiritually that changed my life was that I, I woke up one day and I was 16 and had an experience which was you never have to dance again. You're going to be an actress. You can come off the antidepressants, which I've been put on at that age because of the anorexia and you're going to have a different life. And I went downstairs and announced this to my mother and my grandma. And, that, and I did it and within three months, I think. I had an agent I, I had, and I was acting professionally in, in theatre. And I was just sort of 16, 17. And um, so that was one, I've had a few of them. That was one of them, a, a, a nudge, a spiritual vision or Hmm. No, Hedy, let me, let, let me just, sorry, Hedy, let me stop here for a sec. Uh, tell the listeners a bit about more what that experience was like, that, that spiritual vision and how did it, uh, how did it feel? How did it, uh, how did you know what it, what, what it was and, and, uh, um, and not to was, just discount it? Yeah, it was, there have been a few of them through my life. That, and that was probably one of the first. Um, it was that one wasn't visual. Well, I say it's a vision, but it, I kind of knew it was a bigger being or a 
spiritual connection to me, but I didn't see anything. Whereas a later one, which I'll tell you about in a minute, if you'd like me to, had a vision connected to it. Mm -hmm. This one was um, more of a, a knowing, so a clairsentience, if you like, and a voice. So it was, and I always, and the work I do spiritually, which, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit, but it's always on the left side. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of the left, up, diagonally up on the left is where I see things and hear things. And as I'm recalling it, that was also on the left side. It came, it comes in on the left. And it came in and it wasn't just a fancy, it was much bigger dimension. It was a, it was a powerful, life-changing, monumental, you know, huge mm -hmm. energy force telling you what to do. Were you afraid? No. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I did it, no question. I followed it, probably a life-saving moment for me, mm -hmm. as it turns out, as they've often been, these moments. Yeah, I want to tell you the next one. Yeah, I, I do, but just before we, we do yeah. it, I want to I wanna talk to the fact that, um, you know, having, you know, been in ballet and, and having been told what to do for uh, so long, uh, the fact that you get this uh, message uh, and mm. you believe it and you do it uh, takes a lot of courage. And, uh, you know, I just want to, you know, um, talk to the listeners a little bit about understanding the power of this. This isn't like another human being telling you something. This is something that just feels right. And mm. uh, it, it, it seems to summon up uh, the power um, to be able to act on it. And uh, some people don't, some people will discount it. Some people who are very logical and linear will just sort of say, oh, you know, that was just a fleeting thing. But the experience is so much fuller. And the key, of course, is they are uh, just delivering a message to us. It's up to us to take the action. And, and as you mentioned, Hetty, it was a life changer for you. It was a big one. Mm -hmm. You know, if you didn't have the courage, if you didn't have the wherewithal to uh, follow uh, that um, uh, that advice, uh, I'm sure your life would have been very, very different. Mm, definitely. Mm -hmm. And possibly life saving in some ways, maybe. Mm -hmm. as, as, I, as the next one was, it was life saving. Okay, so please share. And, and that one was visual. Well, I, I then became an actress, and I was very lucky, very quickly. I, I got work immediately, as I said, literally within a couple of months in the theater, and then went on to do television. And I really wasn't out of work. I, I went from one job to the next, which was amazing. And um, it was absolutely my lifeline out of this very, you know, difficult environment I was living in with my mother and godmother. And, however, I was still anorexic, but I was a functioning anorexic. So I, I made sure my weight didn't go below a certain level, but it was very controlled. And, and I was still in the grip of this mental health issue. The depression was better because I was following my path as an actress. I was, I was driven now to, and allowed myself to have this vacation. However, I was still unwell with, with anorexia and but people wouldn't know they would just think I was a slim girl they wouldn't have a clue because you know it was I, nobody knew apart from my mother and family or whatever when I was 20 so this would have been a four years later <clears throat> I had another experience I woke up three nights running at the same time each night 28th, 29th, and 30th of May. This was 1976. And uh, quarter to four in the morning. And I had an experience. This time it was a vision. It was the same knowing as before when I was, you know, prompted to change my life. It's the same power, and yet I, it, it, there was a visual. <laughs> and the visual was, I can still remember it so clearly. It wasn't 
um, you couldn't kind of touch it, but you could see it, if that makes sense. And it wasn't an angel, but it kind of, I knew it kind of was in a way, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was another spiritual dimension being showing me this. And I, the vision was, and there was a line down the middle, and on the left was death, and on the right was life. Mm. And on the death side, I, I could see myself as a, physically how I was then, which was very waist like. You know, I was underweight, really, um, like a waif, you know, and long, sort of dark blonde hair and very waif like. And the picture was of me on this left hand side, and it, the, the me was going towards death, basically. I was in death. I was going towards death. And then on the right side was me, much more as I am physically now and, and have been ever since. Very different physically to that wave. That was life. And it was a choice. And the being said, you know, what's it to be? If you stay where you are, you will die. If you start, if you change your decision about your life and you start eating and you, you start to live in a different you know, different way, and you, you master this um, issue you have, you know, uh, you will live. And I, ch you know, I chose life, and I started eating properly the next day. I, it was really, really difficult, because of course, any sort of mental health issue of that nature is you're suppressing and you're controlling. So all the things that I couldn't really deal with, it all came up, you know, because I just forced myself to start eating normally and it was really, really hard because all the all the all the issues tumbled out, you know. And then that, life that's... changed course again. But I got a l I had a life and I had to go into serious therapy and then psychoanalysis and God knows what in my twenties to you know, to handle all the stuff that had been stuffed down and it's be you know, it's an ongoing journey. I'm still dealing with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We all are. It, it's so interesting that that you were mm, provided this opportunity to see the vision because a lot of people uh, don't realize that the path they're on uh, is going to uh, lead more uh, to darkness and and more towards mm -hmm. mm, a life that may not necessarily be death, but feels death-like and full of suffering. And what I mm -hmm. found so amazing in your story is how you uh, overcame uh, this, uh, you know, mental uh, illness because, uh, you know, anorexia is and the fact that the mind is so powerful. Uh, mm. and I'm, I'm sure that other people uh, can try to convince you to start eating, but it is only when you faced this powerful entity uh, that you realized that, you know, how serious it was. Yes. And, and w without any other traditional, uh, you know, uh, mental health therapy, you simply made the decision. And, and so there it is twice uh, in, in a period of, mm. uh, you know, a, a number of years, you were faced with spirit telling you that you could do it and you believed it. And, and so that's amazing. And I'm assuming by this story that there wasn't a lot of spiritual connection in between those two messages. Is that correct? Well, I I had, you know, I did have spiritual belief. I was allowing myself that then, but I certainly hadn't had anything of that ilk between those two. I was, and I was, very, you know, anorexia or anything of that kind is, is very controlled. You're controlling your um, your, your environment very much and apart from acting and um, feeling myself creatively in that way it was a very controlled existence and not a happy one because if you're if you're living with that amount of control and self-harm basically you're self-harming on a daily basis it's not a good place to be in is it <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. For sure, for sure. No. Any, any other messages um, have come to you over the over the oh, year? Oh gosh, yes. Oh gosh, yes. At various times. I mean, I remember 
probably a few, few years after that, I was in a, a very abusive relationship. Um, and I had, I had the sense again, it was the, um, the, the, the feeling, the being, you have to get out of this, otherwise this could kill you. Again, it was, you know, they've been quite extreme. These, it's like, this is, this could kill you. You've got to get out of it. That was the one with that destructive relationship. And, um, and at other times, um, directionally, if I'd been, you know, going down the wrong road, there'd be this sense of, of a force or a feeling from inside directing me. I mean, sometimes, you know, not as dramatic as those incidences, but just directionally. I mean, for example, um, more recently when I'd, I'd moved out, I felt it was right to move out from London to the country because I was very burnt out from life, you know, and my roller coaster life um, for all sorts of reasons. And it was the right thing to get out of London and take a step back from acting, write this comedy series, which it, in fact, I used that, that experience that I told you about the vision of life and death is in my comedy series. It, it, it funny. It's a funny scenario, and I, I bring in characters that are kind of versions of myself, perhaps a bit more extreme, and bring in humour. Um, and so I love the fact that one can do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. One can, you know, use a, a hugely deep experience like that and transform it into a creative another shape and form which in fact is, is a comedy um, and I, I, I feel that's very positive. Anyway, when I was going out of London for years ago and I, I felt the direction to take me out of London, that I needed to have peace, I needed to have solitude, rest, recovery time, take myself away from acting, do my spiritual work which I've been doing, working on psychic lines, being a a spiritual coach, but under the guise of psychic companies, and write my the series, which is called Hook, which I'm trying to get made. It's, we've come a long way now. We're, we're, we're nearly there, I think. Now. I've got amazing actors attached, and it's, it's very exciting. But um, at that point, I followed my inner direction. So in, in, rather than it coming in a sort of being, a, a, a greater being sense, like the the experiences I've just told you about, it will also come in the way of like an internal direction. So the internal direction was pushing me, a bit like I said about creativity, it's like it moves around inside you and tells you where it wants to come out. In a way, it was a bit like that. It was like inner direction. You've got to get out of London. You need peace. You need to reconnect with some family, which my nieces, my sister died, and their cho- our children. And that was all very important. And just to have time out, to, to kind of what I call hang up the red shoes. I don't know if you know the ballet, but, you know, time off now. Just, you don't have to perform. You've been doing it since you were three. You can give yourself a break. And if something comes in for you that you want to do, then do it. But otherwise, you're not chasing it anymore. And that was very, very, very important for me to do. And I did. And so I did the spiritual work, psychic work and the coaching, which really, really taught me so much because in a way to uh, develop that side of me, which it was probably always been there, obviously, because I was having these visions and experiences since a child, but I hadn't worked with it so intensely and um, developed it to this extent. And then, of course, helping people with it, um, which was completely different to my life as an actress, you know, obviously. But I kept it very hidden in a way until now. I'm really sort of coming up in a way now because I want to build up my own spiritual practice, um, transformational life coaching, Hetty Baines, alongside my career as an actor because I th- and my career as a screenwriter. In that three years where I sort of had that healing, and it very, it very much was a healing, and the house that I lived in felt incredibly um, 
nurturing and I did feel there were beings there kind of uh, helping me recover and I um, also went through this my own personal transformation then I came to the point where I didn't know six months nine months ago where the feeling was changing I, I call it I don't know if you know the film Mary Poppins but it was like the Mary Poppins weather vane was changing so it was from inside me going you've got to get back to London actually you should get your acting career back again now and you want to get your project made and you need to be back in London so I just followed it I didn't quite know how it's going to work but I dreamt the flat I'm in I literally had a vision of my flat <laughs> and I I looked up on the um the right move in in England we have a you know online and I knew the area because it was where I used to live. So, and I looked online, I had the picture of the view that I dreamt. And I phoned them up, I said, that's the flat, I've just dreamt it. And that is the flat where I'm now living. <laughs> um, so I followed it again, and I had the direction was, also, you've got to get yourself a top agent again. You know, no mercy, but you've got to get right back on top level. You must get yourself a top agent. And I followed it and I felt the direction again. And another acting friend had said, oh, well, maybe my agent might be good. And I asked him about their agent. And then um, this other potential agent, which was called Diamond Management, which I thought would be perfect. This other, um, I turned on the radio and the, the music was playing Diamonds Are Forever. So I knew, <laughs> I knew that it was that the right agent was down in management, and actually it was. I phoned them up. She said, "Come in." She said, "We love you," and of course, here you are. Thank you very much. I'm now with them. So just recently, just sharing those two experiences, where um, I followed the direction. It didn't come in like from the outside. It was it was very much inside, and then those little signposts. So dream little signpost like the message on the radio um, and just following signs and even finding you Jeffrey I would say was me following the sign because I was I, I, I woke up that night I read the thing I felt it from the inside get in touch with him you know so I do believe that signs come in if you're open Right. And Hetty, what kind of advice would you give to the to the listeners who maybe have not um, been able to connect to those signs? It sounds like you have been divinely rather divinely guided uh, for a number of years. And uh, some people I'm sure are listening, saying, well, where are my guides and how come they're not talking to me? Uh, what kind of advice would you give people to be able to connect and hear their messages from the universe? I think. What happens is, and this I, I know too, because I, it sounds like I'm having these wonderful things all the time. I'm never having the opposite. It's not true. <laughs> I have the opposite too, so I'll get clutter brain. I won't. I, I'll get confusion. I won't know if that's a sign or not. You know, I, I get that too. And I think it's being able to um, recognize when it's a. a an intuition when it is a real sign that's showing you the way then it could be a fear thing or a mental thought that's pushing you in the wrong direction you get confused there's a different quality to it and if you start to um, meditate and try and open up that side of yourself I feel it becomes easier for you to determine which is which you still need help you still need people to go you know that's that's the that's your ego or that's your fear this is the this is the the soul the spirit that's showing you the way because i believe we're all spirits you know we're all spirit we're you know bigger than our bodies we're just having a body human experience and so actually that's the greater part of us if we could only really recognize that and when I'm doing the work with clients, often it's to help them connect with their spirit, you know, their, that side of themselves, and facilitate um, 
them to connect with their spirits. So in a way, I, I see myself often as a, a, um, a you know, somebody, a go-between between spirit and human life so that I'm facilitating that cognizance or that awareness so that they can connect with their own spirit because it's much better for them than just for me to say, tell them what to do. It's much better to help mm -hmm. facilitate their shift in perception so that they connect with their own spirit and um, have the clarity to, to then know what direction to take. And, what I find most exciting in the work I do in, with clients, and I call it a crack the code session, where we might get to the absolute root of, of, of the issue that where they're blocked or, where, or what their, their belief system is stuck, or they're not allowing themselves to trust their intuition, whatever it is, to show them the right direction. And that's fantastic, you know, that it feels, um, great <laughs> right. to help people have that so i think i think we all have the facility to find that connection with our spirit but we also all have have the um ability to, to lose it you know even if you work with it for others and you have that strong connection yourself you can still lose it well it, 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 it's like going to the gym eh? you have to keep working out to keep those muscles yeah. up and uh, and and yeah. intuition is very much uh like that um Tell me just for uh, briefly, what's it like working on the psychic hotline? Gosh, well, um, it's taught me so much. Um, I, it's challenging because you, you don't know who you're going to get. And a lot of the people one gets are on the path, you know, that they're aware of um, consciousness and law of attraction and all those things. But you get the occasional person who isn't, who just wants fortune telling, you know, which I really won't do. Mm -hmm. you, <laughs> you just have to bat them back in the nicest possible way and just go and say, don't get somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> we don't sell, you know, we don't sell fortunes here, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when people want predictions, I, I try and get into the fact that, you know, there's options, you know, for the futures and it's very hard to to be able to give somebody you know answers in that way you can give them direction and you can say there's there's potentials you know um but i feel a bit like you know i, I should be a bank i'm working in futures you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I i i don't like to to do that then. but so i try to make it more of a spiritual coaching and actually the companies i work for have that intention mm -hmm. not more often than not. Right, but now you're going to sort of strike out on your own and bring your yeah. uh, your gift to the world, and uh, yes. I'm sure you must be looking forward to that. Uh, tell the listeners a bit about uh, um, what your transformational uh, coaching is going to look like. Well, I do have some private clients that have found me over the last you know few years while I've been doing this work with the psychic lines, it would just be maximizing the same thing I do with them, really, where we book sessions, you know, you might want to course sessions, or I just there with me, it depends what the, the person wants. And and I work with them on the on this level. And I bring a mixture of I, my skills to, to play in this, which, you know, I feel I'm, I'm a bit like a mixture of an agony aunt, a priest. Mm -hmm. uh, a psychic, uh, a life coach, a personal, you know, self development trainer, um, a confidant. You know. mm -hmm. um, so I feel it's kind of a mixture of all those things. Excellent. But I, I, I do feel that it's completely individual for each person that comes to me. So because I work in the way I do, bringing all the various skills plus life experience. Um, and it really helps when the person's open and then they've done, so they've got a certain amount of self-knowledge, which really helps. Mm -hmm. But I have a, a way of working, but I'm very, very open to mm -hmm. what comes in with each person. It's completely unique to each person. Mm -hmm. So, and I love that, you know, 
I'm open to what comes in for that person in a session. And especially if they're open to the spiritual side. I mean, they might come to me for much more traditional life coaching goals and that kind of thing, which is perfectly great. And I can do that for someone. If yeah. they're open to the spiritual side, then I can work on those dimensions more. And I can bring in, you know, spiritual guidance that comes in in the shape of energy work or, you know, visions will come in, um, insights. I'll, I'll, I'll go into whatever the situation is and I will see things and hear things about it mm -hmm. because of having opened it up in this way. But then I'll bring in the guidance from the coaching side to help work with them, to help them, you know, transform and shift so that they can move their lives on. And I give free email backup support with it. It will just be really an extension of what I'm doing with my private clients. I just haven't promoted it at all before. Right. I haven't called myself anything. I know I am, but I haven't yet formed a website or anything because this is also this is hot off the press, as you know, Jeffrey. And you've actually been part of helping me um, believe in this and, and go forward with this. Well, it's been my pleasure. Hedy, uh, our time is coming uh, close to the end, but before we do, um, you, you've had a, a, an amazing life. It has had its challenges. It, ha has, it has had its ups, its downs. What, um, what advice would you give to the listeners from what you have learned from your life? Really, to, to, to be able to connect in with the spiritual side, I, I think it is the key one of the key points um as as beings um to to allow that spirit that soul that is is in there even if you've lost touch with it your authentic self and your soul to allow yourself to recognize it to listen to it and to follow it mm -hmm. and to not doubt that i think that's probably and sometimes life can be really hard as we know, and I really have had some big ups and downs, and mm -hmm. that's always seen me through. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> it, it certainly carry on doing that. It, it, it's a great, <laughs> it's a great piece of advice because it certainly sounds like it was a lifesaver to you, and um, I certainly encourage the listeners to not necessarily wait until you get into that sense of desperation. Spirit is waiting for you mm -hmm. all of the time. Mm -hmm. um, they are, uh, their, their channel is opened. It's just up to us uh, to open the channel so we can communicate with them. So uh, excellent mm -hmm. advice. I greatly appreciate it. Hedy, thank you so much for being an amazing uh, guest. Uh, your bio and your contact information will be in the uh, podcast description. Uh, I really appreciate you taking time out. I wish you the best of luck as you transition into um, into this this journey where you're not only going to be able to fulfill your your creative ventures, but also your spiritual ventures. And and I think that's an, an, a great inspiration for all of us to realize that life has both our spiritual divine component and our human component as well. Uh, any last words, Hetty? No, just thank you so much for having me as a guest on your on your podcast, your show, yeah. and um, I'm thrilled to be a part of your world, Jeffrey. Thank you so and much, thank Hedy. Thank you for being part of mine. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Once again, my name is Jeffrey Eisen. I'm a spiritual life coach, channeler of Shaltazar, and an energy intuitive. You can learn more about me on my website, jeffreyeisen.com. I highly encourage you to check it out. There's lots of great content and offerings on the website. If you wish to be a guest on the, on the Sheltazar episodes of the Jeffrey Eisen podcast, please drop me a line at jeffrey at jeffreyeisen.com. Thank you all for listening. Love and light to you all. <laughs>